I remember one race where I was in the break, three riders up the road, and we were quite sure we were going to make it to the finish line. Uh, but then we had to wait for a train uh, with 20k to go, <laughs> which like took a whole minute standing there. And then with five kilometers to go, suddenly Van der Poel came from the back and just <laughs> didn't even look back and he won solo. So that's still a bit of a scar. I was like, that could have been the one day of me being on the top podium spot and Van der Poel being somewhere like fourth or fifth, but <laughs> not, not that day. Like some of the good riders, like there are good riders, um, but it's also like a, a pyramid and you need to build the bottom of the pyramid, like a really uh, uh, conducive environment for people to start a sport and to, uh, to simply compete. Um, so I think races coming up in different corners of India, uh, races in Hyderabad, races in Goa, uh, races in Bangalore, Chandigarh, um, yeah, I think that's a good development and that's what uh, the sport needs. I am Baiki Winky and this is the Working Athlete Podcast. Here I talk to working athletes from all walks of life and experts from various sports to provide you with inspiration, training tips, time management and lifestyle advice. If this is something that interests you, please make sure you subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss any future episodes. Today's guest, Rick Noble, is a UCI pro rider who rides at some of the top UCI races all across the world. He recently represented his home country, Netherlands, in the Gravel World Championships alongside Matthew van der Poel with the Dutch national team. This 28-year-old already has over 15 years of racing experience. He currently works in India with the Dutch embassy and has been taking part in our local races in Bangalore, Chandigarh, etc. while also riding everywhere in the country where he needs to travel for work. In this episode, we talk about his racing career and how it changed over the years. What are the differences in racing in various parts of the world and how he manages to keep fit while being on the move as part of his job. I really enjoyed this conversation. I hope you would too. With that, let us get into my chat with Rick Noble. Welcome to the Working Athlete Podcast, Rick. It's a Thank pleasure you. having you here. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, Rick, I always start uh, the podcast with uh, this question because I call this the Working Athlete Podcast. I, I start with what is work for you and how does your typical work day look like? Uh, right, yeah, I don't think there's a typical work day for me, um, but I try to make it somehow look like this. I wake up early um, and ride like around six. So I do my riding uh, uh, before work and then uh, have a nice breakfast post ride somewhere with coffee. Um, then I cycle to the embassy. I work at the Netherlands embassy in, uh, in Delhi, uh, take a shower there and sit down in the office um, and start the job. Usually uh, a day includes uh, a lot of meetings, but also uh, site visits or uh, uh, meetings at the Ministry of uh, Agriculture in, uh, in Delhi. Um, but I also have a lot of duty trips all over India. Um, and then I try to take my bicycle um, so I can explore a bit and uh, start my day off well. Um, for example, I had a duty trip to uh, Guwahati in Assam. Took the bicycle and rode every morning with local riders. And that adds a little bit uh, to, uh, to the experience. Otherwise, you just see meeting rooms and offices. So, oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, the bike always plays a role uh, wherever I go. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. So uh, <coughs> that that is your work and it, uh, you know how your work uh, day looks like but uh, uh, coming to cycling how when did you start cycling how did cycling start for you um well i grew up in the netherlands and then you start cycling as soon as you're three or four but just like 
cycling to school and these kind of things. Cycling races in the village with your friends. Um, and then I first started playing football. But when I was 12, 13, I started racing. Um, so, yeah, I've been racing now for um, almost 15 years. Uh, wow. Since you were 12? Yeah, yeah. So you are now, what, uh, 27? I'm tw I just turned 28. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. Nice, nice. So, 15 years of uh, uh, racing yeah. in your legs right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, what were the, uh, these 15 years, um, uh, how was the progression like uh, in your cycling? Um, yeah, the progression. It started off as like I, I borrowed a bicycle from the local club uh, to try some local races and from there I moved to the national crits um, for for youth in the Netherlands there's quite a lot of races uh, mostly crits in a village um, uh, a race around the church as we call it uh, because the city center mostly has a church and then you race uh, the roads around it um, so that's how it started off and uh, first my parents were a bit reluctant to travel to the races with me because I'm like yeah you just started uh, just try some local races first and then you can go to the national level but soon enough uh, they had to travel every weekend with me to uh, to the different races and um, yeah I uh, all I did aside from school was training and uh, had this aspiration of becoming a, a pro and uh, um, yeah, everything was dedicated to cycling. I think till the age of 17, 18, um, uh, when I was a junior rider, um, uh, still very ambitious, lots of racing, but then I started studying, um, and I broadened my horizon a little bit. I started traveling also off the bike, um, student life in the Netherlands also involves going to the bar and drinking a lot of beer. Um, <laughs> so racing was a bit more on the background, took it a little bit less serious. Uh, and I think that's where a, like a new kind of cycling life started for me, um, where I raced abroad a lot. I saw it more as a, a way of like discovering and uh, going on adventures. So I started racing with like a new team in uh, some African races. Uh, my first one was Tour of Senegal. Um, and I was hooked ever since, like discovering new countries on the bicycle. Um, but from there on, also that became more serious. So I improved as a rider again. And I found this sweet spot of having a lot of joy in uh, in cycling and racing in all these new countries. And yeah, that's basically what I've been doing ever since. Um, racing all over the world on the UCI level, but not letting go of that fun life where I'm also able to drink a beer with my friends in the bar or right. um, take some time off of the bicycle or combining it with a full-time job. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's been great all those 15 years, but I think especially this rediscovery of cycling and also using it as a way of connecting to people and uh, discovering the world, whereas I first really saw it as something um, yeah, just dedicated to be as good as I could be on the on the bicycle and um, becoming a pro and all of that, focused on numbers. And now I can go weeks without looking at power numbers or whatsoever. The last time I trained with a heart rate monitor is I think five years ago. So um, <laughs> okay, yeah. that's that's quite a change, right? Uh, so uh, what kind of uh, triggered that change? Uh, from someone who is looking to turn pro to someone who is, you know, more balanced and, you know, taking cycling as something that he enjoys while also being quite competitive, right? Yeah, it's it's not like a, a one moment when you have that realization. It's more of a transition. Um, it's when you discover other things in life as well. At that time, um, I grew up in a village of 60 people in the Netherlands, uh, very small on a farm. Uh, so the world was quite small for me. But then um, as I grew older, my brother started traveling. 
um, he started living in South Korea for his studies and that also like um, inspired me to uh, broaden my horizon and um, also like I started studying uh, um, at an international university meeting people from all over the world so slowly but surely this realization oh, there's more in the world than riding a bicycle um, so I think that's uh, that slowly but surely uh, changed yeah right so the travel and you know travel for studies and tra travel in general kind of broadened your horizon uh, you think yeah but also uh, uh, to be honest the realization that I I'm not I didn't have the kind of talent to ever be a world tour level rider um, at least also the, the sacrifices it takes to reach that level I didn't really think I had it in me because um, I realize I find joy in a lot of other things in life. Um, so just riding, uh, eating, sleeping, um, that's not the kind of life I would want for myself. So I think those things combined um, changed my cycling life. Yeah. Right. So, <clears throat> yeah, like you said, uh, being at the world tour level, needs a lot more it it is a lot more than talent right you have to uh, make a lot more sacrifices and yeah. be a lot more focused yeah that and uh, i think you have to give away a lot more things that than what people re uh, realize yeah and even then the chances of making it are quite small mm. um of course you have these super talents that will always make it but there's a big pool of riders that i even now still race with on a continental level that have easily the level to be on one of those teams but just because there's hundreds of them there's only a few that uh, that make it through um so yeah you have to basically give up uh, a lot of things um, at least that's what it felt like for me for a lot of those riders it doesn't feel like they're giving up anything because it's all they want but I figured I also want other things in life. Yeah, yeah. It, it at the end of the day, it is also about prioritization and individual choices, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So what uh, you talked about uh, Tour of Senegal as your first race after you, uh, you know? Yeah. So when was this and what were you doing at that time? It was in 2015. Mm -hmm. um, and I found out about this group of riders that race all over the world and they were kind of my heroes. I wasn't really looking up to, um, I don't know, Peter Sagan or any of these riders. I was like, oh, these guys, that's cool. Um, so I managed to uh, become a part of it and join for that race. And it wasn't even on the UCI calendar, it was a national race. and. Um, one day before the race started, we hadn't seen any other rider. We hadn't seen any sign of a race taking place. Uh, we were in a random hotel and um, then suddenly everything started. Uh, there was a politician who came to open the race, uh, but he overslept. So we, we started at two in the afternoon <laughs> in the scorching heat, 44 degrees. Um, so we, the sleep schedule of the politician determined the race yeah, start basically yeah yeah and i think a lot of riders would hate that but i kind of like yeah this is the kind of experiences uh i want to have and um th there was one stage where the the winner came from the one side of the road and the number seconds came from the other side because there was like chaos <laughs> in the route um and I was like, oh, so this also <laughs> exists, this kind of racing. This. And there were riders from France, from uh, Germany, but also all the national teams from Africa and like uh, just hanging out with them and uh, going through that race together. It was such a cool experience. And I was also looking already at like an international career. And um, so it, it worked well together. I mean, we would pay a visit to the embassy of the Netherlands in these countries and getting to know those diplomats slowly but surely. I was like, ah, this could also be a life for me. So um, it's- What were you doing at that time? Uh, I was studying, yeah. Um, in the end, I spent seven years studying instead of four, um, just because I was racing all the time. 
okay. <laughs> there were there was a year where I didn't show up university at all, and I did close to uh, a hundred racing days um, wow. in I think twelve different countries, maybe. Um, so at that time, I was working as a bike messenger um, to pay for my travels and everything. Um, so just delivering. Uh, um, this is in the Netherlands. Yeah, this was as in a the Netherlands. bike messengers. Yeah. Okay. So doing that and just traveling all the time for races. Um, yeah, those years, 2015, 16, 17, 18. That's basically all I did. Yeah. Okay. So uh, was it during this period that you kind of got into the work life that you have right now? Yeah, more or less. Um, uh, after I graduated, I got a job at the Embassy of the Netherlands in uh, Burkina Faso, which is in West Africa. Um, and that was basically the start of my career. Um, and I was obviously still racing and riding. So I found a local team there um, because it's a national sport of, uh, of the country. And there was a big race in, in the capital every, every Sunday. Um, so it was a great cycling experience as well. And when I would do my groceries during the week, people would recognize me and they would like, yeah, we'll cheer for you on the weekend. And uh, yeah, and also like uh, witnessing all the politics around cycling, and uh, which was crazy over there. Uh, was also taught me a lot about the country itself. So bike riding is also like a lens uh, to the place you're living in. So that that was yeah pretty cool and so it was both start of my professional career but also um, just another great chapter in my cycling life yeah yeah how was the racing there uh, what kind of racing uh, you know formats or distances were there, there? Um, it was usually between 100 and 180k circuit races or first go out on the highway come back and then race in the city center um, the main road of the capital would be like um, shut for traffic and just bike racing. Oh. And the level was incredibly high. Um, like all these riders, the top riders were full-time cyclists. Um, so they were pretty good and they all worked together. And if I attacked, everyone would start shouting like, he's going. And so I never won a race there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, like a lot of podium finishes, but I never won. Um, yeah. So from from there, where did you go after uh, your initial assignment there? I went back to the Netherlands for a couple of years. Um, I worked at the Ministry of uh, Agriculture uh, in the Netherlands doing uh, European Union negotiations on agriculture and signed a contract with a team from uh, like a team of my friends, a continental team and uh, I raced with them for the past two years um, like also during the pandemic still managed to do some uh, some cool races uh, some hard races on the European calendar like in, in Poland uh, France um, Greece um, so there was also like I've, I had done all these races all over the world um, kept racing in the Netherlands as well on a national level but these hardcore uh, Europe tour uh, continental races I hadn't done them but I got back to that like the past two years and realized what real bike racing is like <laughs> yeah so what what are the uh, differences uh, you see you have raced all over the world right so um, you know most of these countries that you just mentioned so what were the you know differences you saw in various places in terms of racing um yeah i think in the west african races of which i did quite a few it's mostly the circumstances that make it really hard um the state of the roads um all the um uh, like moving around spending 14 hours in a bus sleeping on the floor somewhere um racing in 42 degrees so if you deal with that well you'll be able to get a result um, but it's mostly the circumstances that make it really difficult. 
um, and the racing style. Like people would sprint for like uh, to place 60th. Um, ev everyone sprints for every spot. Um, and then those Europe Tour races, it's a bit more structured. Like you have big teams um, and it's really difficult to position because everybody perfectly knows how to ride a bike, uh, great bike handling skills. Um, so yeah, the level's just very high and you need to like, you just don't touch the brakes and try to stay in position and it's all different kind of racing. Um, and then I did a few races in Latin America, a lot of climbing. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm not heavy, but I'm quite tall. So, um, racing against riders from Colombia, they're like 48 kilograms, <laughs> um, yeah, incredibly hard. Like I once did the uh, Vuelta Guatemala, which is a race in, uh, in Guatemala, nine stages, seven mountain stages. And it was just fighting against the time limit. So there's not much you can do in such a race. It's just, you start together and then you, the first mountain, the climbers take off and you see them when you reach the hotel in the <laughs> evening. Uh, but yeah, interesting and makes you stronger as a rider. Then I raced in a few Asian races. Tour of Vietnam was quite, quite a cool experience. It was 14 stages. Um, which is a 14 stages. Yeah, yeah, the longest race I've done all the way from Hanoi to Ho Chi Minh in the south. Um, really good sprinters, uh, aggressive racing, um, fast paced racing, uh, very humid, um, but really like well organized and just great racing experience. Um, and then of course, racing in India, uh, <laughs> It's, it's been been a good experience as well. Uh, yeah. ha happy to see races coming up. Um, and I think it's important to support these races as well, like the race in the north around Chandigarh, and of course here in in Bangalore. It's like um, if you want to develop a big racing scene, you just need races, like yeah. and people to show up. Yeah. That's that's key, and I think that's happening. So that's great. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've seen you wearing a CCN kit. Uh, is that a, a team that you raced for as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my current team. Yeah. Okay. So you race uh, currently with the CCN uh, team, is it? Yeah, well, the, they sponsor the kit, CCN, but the mm -hmm. team is called uh, Eurocycling Trips. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Which is a company of a friend of mine who's part of the team. Mm -hmm. He does like cycling trips in Europe for. Uh, whoever wants to go. Yeah. Okay. So what kind of uh, racing uh, uh, you guys are doing right now? Um, yeah, the bigger UCI races worldwide. So uh, they just came back from Tour of Taiwan, which is a 2.1 UCI race. Um, they've done Tour of Thailand. Um, we raced uh, in Guadeloupe, which is a Caribbean island, uh, which is part of France, UCI 2.2 race. 10 days, did it in the summer. It was, uh, it was pretty cool. Um, and yeah, these kind of races, some European races, Tour of Estonia. Um, and then like, I just choose some races because I'm working and I'm in India, so I cannot be there all the time. So I just try to do every race there is in India, uh, do some international gravel races, um, like the gravel world series and world championship and then like two or three stage races with the team. Great. So you, uh, you know, just mentioned uh, about the gravel uh, races and the gravel world championships. Yeah. So you represented, uh, the, you know, your uh, uh, Netherlands, the Netherlands uh, and your uh, teammate with the Ma with Matthew Vanderpool uh, uh, there. How was the experience there? Yeah, it was a good experience. Uh, um, I hadn't been training since the summer, really. Like uh, I took it easy. I was a bit uh, uh, drained after the racing in France. And so I took the foot off the gas. So I wasn't in great shape, um, but it was pretty cool to be part of the team of the Netherlands. And of course, uh, racing with Mathieu, but that 
but well, I mean, he took off from the start and yeah. never saw him again. So, uh, but it was kind of cool to be in the same bunch again. Uh, when racing as a junior, he was also like my age, and ever since, uh, well, he's 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 gr uh, grown as a rider uh, to like yeah, uh, world class, like, yeah. um, one of the best <laughs> riders of his generation. So. But then being in the same race again is pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. So uh, did, did you guys uh, race in the same uh, races uh, as as juniors? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Quite a bit? Yeah, quite a bit. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So um, do you remember anything about uh, how, uh, you know, he was racing back then versus uh, now? Well, the... <laughs> It remained the same. He was winning all the time and he's still doing that. <laughs> Back so. then as well. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, those were like national races in the Netherlands. So now he's racing against the like best of the world. And back then it was just the best riders of our generation in the Netherlands. Um, and he was by far the best rider. So he won most races that he started. I remember one race where I was in the break three riders up the road and we were quite sure we were going to make it to the finish line uh but then we had to wait for a train uh with 20k to go <laughs> which like took a whole minute standing there and then with five kilometers to go suddenly van der poel came from the back and just <laughs> didn't even look back and he won solo so that's still a bit of a scar i was like that could have been the one day of me being on the top podium spot and and the pool being somewhere like fourth or fifth but <laughs> not not that day no yeah yeah so w when was this how old were you at this time i think it was like 15 or 16. okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. so it's 12 years ago uh, yeah. nice nice yeah. <laughs> okay so uh what does uh, your typical training uh, look like training cycle look like um yeah I'm, I'm not that like I don't train in a structured way anymore like um, it's a bit difficult because of work I don't have a lot of time so just do early morning rides uh, usually with my friends in Delhi so it's more of a social thing as well we ride together sometimes we go fast on some hill or some segment and then we drink coffee after and that's mostly what it looks like during the week if I'm really motivated I do indoor training like on the trainer do some intervals uh, and do some swift races but that honestly hasn't happened over the past five six months so um, and then on the weekends i try to do longer rides and uh, try to get in some some hard work especially for those gravel races you need to be able to sustain like a high power for hours so i try to mimic that on some weekend rides uh, but I just try to enjoy myself on the bike and um, having been racing for that long, you also just have to level like um, if you just ride your bike. Uh, yeah. So because you are already over the years, you have trained yeah. uh, so much that you have you are at the level now, more or less it's about maintenance and a little bit of tuning here and there. Yeah. But of course, if I like if you do proper intervals and really sleep enough and everything, I would be a much better rider. But um, it's it's just my way of going about cycling now and I'm quite happy with it. Like also just weekends in the hills with friends or I went to Ladakh for a week just to have experience riding above 5,000 meters uh, above sea level. Like these kind of things is not really uh, physiological idea behind it uh, but I just enjoy it so yeah. I enjoy long rides as well like I rode from Delhi to Rishikesh two times it's like a 260k ride wow. like going on these kind of rides is something I really like as well and I haven't studied like the science of it I don't think it necessarily makes you better as a uh, competitive road cyclist but um, for me finding joy in bike riding is the most important thing and then usually what really makes me better is racing so just doing a lot of races but that's not possible anymore yeah current uh like uh job and everything um but that like 
the past years pre-pandemic i would just have like at least 60 racing days a year and then you just rest a bit in between the races and you maintain this year-round steady level um yeah yeah so you would travel i mean your work also involves quite a bit of travel uh, yeah. and all that so with that <clears throat> if you are able to you know ride ride uh, that itself is uh, quite a good thing i think yeah. you know, maintaining any sort of structure and all it becomes uh, a little bit uh, of a challenge there as well yeah right? yeah mm. but just getting the kilometers in like is is important i think i'm now at 13000 kilometers this year which is still uh, quite okay yeah yeah, yeah. it is so considering the travel and everything yeah yeah so then you'll be able to maintain a certain level uh, good enough to compete in the in the races here um and uh i did well in some gravel races and yeah it's been quite a good year actually so yeah so you have done all sorts of uh, riding right uh, road road races uh, gravel racing and all that um, any mountain biking as well yeah but not that much i like mountain biking like uh, mountain bike marathons I did a few in the Netherlands, like uh, long ones, 200k uh, mountain bike marathons uh, in winter, uh, which was It'll great. It'll be quite muddy, I guess. Yeah, it's insane. It's every year on the 28th of December, 200k mountain bike race. Wow. Lots of six, k. single tracks. You start in the dark at 6 a.m. Well, temperature is close to or below zero and <laughs> you just go. Um, so that's a race i really enjoy um i did some of the 88 races in delhi like the mountain bike races right yeah um i enjoy mountain biking yeah i would want to do it more in the future as well um yeah okay. and i did uh, some track racing um, and fixed gear road racing like the the crits um where where, where is this uh, the track racing and uh, fixed gear road racing Track racing was in the Netherlands and the uh, fixed gear racing also partly in the Netherlands, but I also did the Red Hook series in New York, in uh, Milan and in Barcelona. Um, yeah, but uh, I think it ended in 2018, the Red Hook series. And that's also when I quit fixed gear racing, more or less. Yeah. Mm. So what is your uh, favorite uh, racing format in all this? What do you enjoy the most? Uh, I enjoy road crits, like technical uh, courses, a lot of cornering, um, and long stage races in a difficult environment. So mm -hmm. hot, um, like lots of travel, um, so where everyone's exhausted, like beyond a certain point, and that's when I'm at my best. So. Um, wow I, I i like that kind of racing right and when you come home and you were like yeah this was something <laughs> yeah yeah so these are uh, two different spe you know uh, sounds like two different uh, ends of the spectrum right? yeah for sure the crit racing uh, short intense and uh, technical uh, yeah. stuff and then the other end is long stage races with uh, you know difficult uh, travel and everything yeah. so w what what kind of uh, is a common thing that uh, makes it uh, you know enjoyable for you i don't <laughs> think between those two there's really a common thing yeah. um i just like all kinds of riding and mm -hmm. crits i have I, I think i'm good at it um, so that helps makes it enjoyable yeah and uh, these long stage races i like as an experience and i'm also quite good at them just in terms of dealing with the circumstances uh, recovering well um, yeah yeah excellent excellent <coughs> so uh, how long have you been in india uh, now i think one year and five months now mm -hmm. so you have uh, by now you have uh, uh, traveled extensively in india and also participated in uh, a few races if i remember correctly you are uh, you have a two out of two record at bbch uh, right now or if it was is that more yeah i did two yeah yeah and i did uh, a race in chandigarh um i raced the 88 mountain bike race um 
yeah so i did a few races yeah yeah so how how do you uh, see the races here uh, when you compare to others or just uh, in general um i think here in the south there's a good uh, cycling culture in general and uh, upcoming racing culture which is uh, good and important like the pack increases the pack size i think that's great just looking around and just seeing a, a crowd a racing crowd um so that's something what i what i like and some of these riders are quite good um and they're also like racing against the lbb guys they they're with multiple riders so that's that's of course a challenge um yeah um, but i also think there's a lot to gain um in a country of 1.4 billion people um we should have more races on the calendar oh, uh, definitely definitely and yeah. i think the organizations should work together um i mean it's the only way to improve riders improve uh uh the quality of races just like knowledge sharing and reaching out to each other uh because cycling is a very scary sport to start with and very overwhelming and if you make it even more difficult for people to be part of that structure um the the scene will never grow so you always need to reach out to people that want to try it and um also the the riders that are like um like riders of with a good level some of the LBB guys and of course uh, Naveen John and Arvind Panwa who have raced around the world as well they also need frequent competition to be able to um compete internationally um so you need those racing days at home you need to be able to challenge each, each other at home and that takes the whole sport to a higher level so i think these are quite fundamental things that are um needed in indian cycling so like some of the good riders like there are good riders um but it's also like a, a pyramid and you need to build the bottom of the pyramid like a really uh a conducive environment for people to start a sport and to uh, to simply compete um so i think races coming up in different corners of india uh races in hyderabad races in goa uh races in bangalore chandigarh um yeah i think that's a good development and that's what uh, the sport needs yeah 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 when uh, when we started um, it is like the racing scene was not non existent yeah. Uh, yeah back in 2008 uh, a few few riders kind of got together and said let's do a time trial and uh, you know time ourselves and no one actually knew what the time trial was and why what is this racing and all that yeah. and that's how bbsh was born yeah. right and uh, from there on it kind of grew from there you know year on year and th- it became like a, uh, let's have a calendar structure this you know every third sunday of the month and all that so it kind of grew from there and that has become an inspiration for other cities yeah. around the uh, you know country yeah. uh, a few have survived a few are you know come up and go down and all that but it is on the up trend you yeah. know it, it it takes a lot of effort mainly because we don't get the you know support of yeah. uh the authorities or anything you have to run through a lot of hoops to uh, you know take permissions and all that yeah. so that becomes a bit of a issue but you know we, you know uh, we have uh, you know started something like bar bangalore amateur racing yeah. on a smaller scale where we are we don't have you know huge podium prizes or anything like that and you know so that it's uh, uh with the idea of keeping it very low key so that we can do more frequently mm-hmm. as, uh, it kind of keeping it grassroots so that yeah. people get more opportunities to race like you said yeah. you know just uh, as a workout if even if you look at 
right mm-hmm. it will be a good thing to uh, you know test themselves yeah. so uh, navin raj uh, navin john comes there navin raj comes there uh, you know those at the top level as well as someone who is who just started uh, cycling uh, like a, a month or two ago on an mtv also shows up yeah. so that's the kind of uh, you know disparity uh, you know the breadth of uh, talent and stuff like that is there. yeah so it, it is at a very nascent level but it is you know uh, on the uprise so yeah. uh, you know a, li- a little bit l- we are hopeful to see more and more people do it and uh, like you said it is very important for everyone to uh, you know have more opportunities to raise so that their level can uh, go yeah. up but also appreciate new people coming to the sport not be opinionated on the kind of bike they ride or the kind of helmet they wear but just like appreciate everyone absolutely coming yeah. into the sport and just bring them on board that's uh, the yeah. way to go yeah. absolutely because you know everyone we say that everyone who uh, it doesn't matter if you are on an mtv or uh, you know in or a fancy tt bike you are part of the race you can yeah. you can start and race it doesn't there is no barrier of in, you know of entry yeah. so to speak yeah. right so it is important to uh, get there right so uh, what is you have re- uh, you have ridden uh, you know in most places uh, or, you know, around the world right what is your favorite cycling destination as such um yeah that's a difficult one uh, my favorite ride is um the first ride after i come off the plane in the netherlands uh like in my hometown uh the freezing wind uh doing uh ride around the local lake so i think that's that, that's my favorite ride ironically like riding all over the world but the favorite ride is at home always uh, home right i think yeah. that's sums it up but in terms of like most scenic riding i think yeah i studied in south africa and i rode a lot around cape town and that's that's a stunning cycling destination like mm-hmm. rolling hills along the coast and yeah just uh raw beauty um but yeah there's the list is long yeah also riding in the himalayas has been an epic experience yeah, yeah. from uh, where to where did you ride in himalayas i went to ladakh i rode up the taglang la um all the way up and um spent some time in the foothills so went to raniket rode from uh, rishikesh these kind of places so there's much more to uh, to explore still actually but those rides have been a uh, quite a good experience uh, gravel bike or uh, road road, yeah. road bike yeah. yeah yeah so the road conditions were fine for uh, road bike yeah and i can if needed use my road bike as a gravel bike that's fine yeah you have the skills and uh, does it take a wider tires as well or that not uh, needed no i just used the uh, continental like four seasons usually 25 mm-hmm. mm so it's no a special tire yeah, yeah. it also if, if uh, your probably your skills make up for uh, the lack of uh, with road with the yeah, tire I, I i try to yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah nice nice so uh what what are uh, what are some of the tips that you would give for working athletes uh, to do well at work and you know sport yeah i think during this conversation you figured that the advice on how to come up with a structured training nutrition or sleeping plan you don't you shouldn't knock on my door uh but um well but for me the most important thing is joy just don't yeah like do not only look at your fitness progress do not only look at your data but see cycling as an experience and as a vehicle to to meet the best people um uh, and yeah advice just keep riding um it's uh it's the, it's the best sport on earth and um like if if you start cycling it's it's very rough it's very hard and it will stay like that but you will go faster um and 
uh, yeah, do not look only at the bicycle as uh, a fitness. Uh, like some people, uh, when they talk about cycling or running, they talk about cardio. I'm like cardio, it, it sounds like a gym word to me. <laughs> cycling is experience, cycling is adventure, it's about the outdoors. So use the bicycle for that. Um, go into new roads, cycle up that hill, enjoy the view, enjoy the ride. I think that's the kind of advices I can give. And um, yeah, of course, over the years I've gained some knowledge about training and these kind of things, but uh, I don't think I'm the, the right person to uh, advise on those things. But also speaking from working athlete point of view, um, I wouldn't be able to do my job in the same way if I wouldn't be cycling. Like if I sleep in till nine and then go to the office, I feel shittier than I feel when I wake up at five and first do two hours of riding and then go to the office. So it's, um, yeah, it clears the mind and kickstarts the day. So yeah, I wouldn't want to uh, just sit in the office all day. I need the ride basically. Yeah. 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 But it's also if you want to uh, race, like do cycling at a competitive level, you need, do need to sacrifice some things, of course. Um, some of my um, colleagues or other experts, they, they go to Goa every other weekend or um, like do more of these kind of things. Whereas I go to the hills to go training or go for some race. Um, I'm not saying that I never go to a party. Uh, I do. Um, but uh, yeah, y you, you need to make choices to make it work and I use all my leave days, all my holidays to go racing. So it, it, it takes a lot, but for me it's worth it. Um, and I think uh, for a lot of people it is. Nice. Uh, it's been a fantastic uh, conversation. Uh, thank you for taking the time and sharing your experience with the Working Athlete podcast. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Hope to see you on more and more uh, races uh, in Bangalore. I'm moving to Bangalore, so uh, oh, yes. I'll, I'll be here more often. Yeah. So hopefully uh, we'll get the chance to uh, uh, suck your wheel on <laughs> these rides. <laughs> yeah. If you are able to keep up. <laughs> I won't look back. <laughs> you won't look back. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. We'll try to stick. All right. Thanks again. Thank you. That was my conversation with Rick Noble. I hope you enjoyed that. If you are enjoying these podcasts and are finding them useful, please consider supporting the podcast by subscribing to the channel on YouTube as well as on your favorite podcasting app. It really helps. Thanks again for your continuous support. See you next week with another guest.